On January 20th, 1961, President Kennedy, during his inaugural address, shared what is considered one of the most memorable lines in political history. He said this, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. When people band together in sacrificial service for the good, the common good of the whole, great things can happen. When God's people come together in Jesus' name and walk as he walked for the good of the whole, great spiritual things can happen in one's local church. On the surface, this sounds wonderful. The problem is that people by nature are takers, not givers. It's why one of the first words toddlers learn to communicate is mine and no. Why is this, you ask? It's because the default mode of the sinful flesh is to worship the unholy trinity, namely me, myself, and I. It is why in far too many churches, thankfully not here, but in so many churches, there's a reason why 20% of the people do 80% of the, the work. And that is contra the clear pattern and plan of God for his people individually and collectively. Uh, it goes against the whole analogy of the body and the various body parts that make up the church. Uh, this goes against uh, Paul's instructions to the church in Ephesians 4, equipping the saints, pastors and teachers, equipping the saints who will be active to do the work of the ministry. As you turn in your Bibles this morning to the glorious 13th chapter of John, I want you to consider this. And so, my fellow Christians, ask not what your local church can do for you. Ask what you can sacrificially do for the Lord's church. It's a paradigm shift, and it's a necessary one. You say, well, why should we, Pastor? I mean, who died and made you the president? And I just want to say on the onset that this message isn't about my personal vision for this church. This is about us embracing what the Lord wants from his church. What we're talking about and we'll be talking about the next few weeks, is what the master expects from his blood-bought disciples. As we make our way through this monumental text, our outline will be as follows. And if you have your sermon notes, you can fill in the blanks. In verses 1 through 5, we will consider, firstly, the model of humble love. The model of humble love. Verses 6 through 11 unpacks what I'm calling the symbol of spiritual cleansing. And in verses 12 through 17, Jesus presents the pattern of Christ like conduct. The pattern of Christ like conduct. If you are a follower of Jesus, this series is especially for you. And we see that in verses 16 and 17. Jesus speaking to his disciples says this, verse 16. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master. Neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Our study begins with the model of humble love in word and deed. Verse 1, John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper and laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he girded himself about Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. With the ominous shadow of the cross looming over our Lord, remarkably, The thoughts and prayers of the suffering servant are largely with his disciples. Verse 1, the model of humble love in word. Now, before the feast of the Passover, this is the final Passover that Jesus will celebrate before his crucifixion. Jesus is well aware of what's about to take place, for he came for this purpose to live and to die. And and we're told here this sort of summary statement that will carry us all the way through the 17th chapter in the upper room, the 17th chapter including the great high priestly prayer of Christ for his own. We have this summary statement We get an insight into who Jesus was thinking about. And shockingly, it was not himself. Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. This is the model of true love. This is humble love par excellence. I want you to note the special object of God's love in Christ is not the entire world. No, John chapters 13 through 17 highlight, listen, it highlights the special love and affection that Jesus has for his own. Circle those two words. It will be obvious as you read this portion of Scripture, if you were to do so in its entirety, that Jesus has his beloved disciples on his mind. And there's a special kind of affection that the Savior has for believers. And we need to be careful that we do not confuse the Savior's special love for the elect with the Creator's general love for the world. To do so is to conflate one of the most precious truths in Scripture. 
God does not love all people in the same manner. Here we are told that it is Jesus' own disciples that preoccupy his thoughts and that are near and dear to his heart. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Later he'll talk about dying for not only those believers uh, that were present, but those who would come in the future, that is us. And the question is, to what extent does the Son of God love his own? How much does God love his people? Glance back down at the end of verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, the New American Standard translates the original text this way, Jesus loved them to the end. In the original Greek, this is aistelos, which means he loved us to the uttermost. With total fullness, Jesus loves us to the nth degree. How, how far would he go uh, to demonstrate and manifest his love for us. We're shown and given an, an example, a model, a demonstration, a proof of this humble love, this perfect and pure love that flows out of the, the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. The overflow of that love comes down to us in the full. Many people acknowledge some of the struggles and difficulties uh, in their life comes back to uh, the fact that, uh, that they have grown up and currently uh, have a deficiency when it comes to the way in which they're loved. Uh, I, 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 I am the way that I am. I do some of the things that I do. Some people say they, they point to the fact that uh, because uh, that they have not been ever truly loved. This should never be the case for Christians. If believers fix their heart and mind on this precious truth more often, I'm convinced that it would resolve many of our emotional equilibrium and mental health issues. Perhaps uh, on this Father's Day, some of you fathers uh, are feeling the pain because some of the children that you gave so much for have uh, turned their backs on you, and more importantly, on Christ, your Lord and Savior. Some of you children say, oh, I grew up without a, a father, I had an absentee father. All of that may be true, but there is one who loves you dearly. And his love is, is pure and holy. His love is perfect and overflowing. And he loves us so much. He loves us with total fullness. Uh, John gives us this summary statement, and there's a sense in which the remainder of the gospel of John will demonstrate and prove and show us just how much Jesus loves us, those whom he has called by his grace into his family. It's a fair question for the lost world to ask, do Christians really believe the songs that they sing from childhood up through adulthood? If we do, then, then why is it that we claim to have so many of the same problems that the unbelieving world has. Do we actually believe Jesus loves me? This I know for the Bible proves it so. Do we really believe, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, love of every love the best? Tis an ocean full of blessing. 
Tis a haven giving rest. Do we really believe and appreciate, oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. Verse 2. And during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And Jesus knew from the very beginning, according to John 6, 70, that this Judas ram would betray him. All of the original 12 let Jesus down. Only one, however, apostatizes and sells him out. And we're told that the devil finds very fertile soil in cold, unbelieving hearts. You want to make yourself a special target of Satan, unbeliever? Continue to reject the love of God in Christ. It was Satan who is at work in the final hours and day in the life of our Lord. And yet we are reminded throughout the Gospel of John and the Scriptures that Satan's sinister schemes in no way lessens human culpability. Judas is totally responsible for his unbelief. Uh, There's a sense in which his unbelief provides fertile soil for the devil to move and even to, in some ways, control him in seeking to oppose the purposes of God. Uh, Judas, only a madman, would reject the love of Christ. And yet, this is exactly what Judas has done. He's a lost cause. And now he is under the control of Satan. And yet, none of this, none of what takes place during the, uh, the event of the Passover, Jesus' trip then to the Garden of Gethsemane, the future mock trial, and crucifixion, none of this catches Jesus by surprise. It is all according to God's purpose. Verse 3 tells us that this is the case. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. This is shorthand for everything that's already been explained in previous sermons. And so I'm not going to go into any detail again this morning. We come then to the first heading. And the main activity that is preserved for us in Scripture. Here in verses 4 and 5, we have been given the context of what's about to happen. We find the model of humble love. I want you to notice what the humility of love in action looks like. Verses 4 and 5. Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, he girded himself about. We may have a hard time remembering the first time we read the Bible, the first time we, made our, we read chapter by chapter through the gospel, I'm sure that what was the, the common experience of us all, all of us who believe is, is that we had a hard time putting the, the word of God down because we wanted to know what happens next. Specifically, what will, what will Jesus do next? And here we find something that is somewhat shocking. Uh, Jesus is preparing himself to do something radical. Verse 5. 
Why did he prepare himself in this manner? Verse four. He poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Love in word, John 13, 1. Humble love in deed, John 13, 4 and 5. In this act, Jesus demonstrates the extent of his sacrificial love. Though we are all familiar with this story, I pray that the Holy Spirit will allow it to remain fresh in our minds and hearts. This is absolutely radical. And as amazing as this humble display of love is, it is only a preview of greater things to come. Jesus will even stoop lower to demonstrate the love of God in Christ for his own disciples. Just wait until we get to John 18 and 19. So why is it that so many Bible teachers label this action the humility of love? What is it about this foot washing incident that has so captured the minds and hearts of commentaries, commentators, preachers, and Bible students alike? My friend, may I remind you, the lowly task of foot washing was a necessary practice in the first century for four reasons. First of all, let us remember uh, that people wore sandals, uh, not socks and shoes. Second of all, may I remind you that you got to point A to point B, most people The primary mode of transportation was by walking, not riding in an air-conditioned automobile or an Uber. I remind you, in the first century in Israel, there weren't many nicely paved sidewalks. The roads that, that people traveled upon were dusty, dirty, littered with animal droppings. It's like what happens when a city slicker wears the wrong footwear to to their friend's farm. And finally, just to set the context, remember that when people wined and dined, that they didn't sit at a table with chairs. Generally, they would uh, rest on on a pillow as we've seen portraits of things like in the Last Supper, leaning on one another, feet to head, head to feet. Anyone that has been around active teenagers knows the distinct, unpleasant odor of sweaty feet. I remember one of Jude's friends who doesn't go to this church, goes to another. Not a bad thing, actually. He brought his shoes into the house after playing outside when it was wet, and it was like a Yankee candle for the whole house. (laughs) Unforgettable. We understand wet dog smell. We understand bad morning breath. And then there's, there's this. So it's not surprising that foot washing would be typically delegated to the lowest ranking servant. The upper room, however, was providentially not staffed. Jesus had remembered everything and actually had not forgotten about this. God is in control of the circumstances and settings He's always at work, even behind the scenes, often behind the scenes. 
to give the, di- the disciples an opportunity to show their deficiencies and to give to us an unforgettable portrayal of the beauty of Christ. Uh, specifically, the model of humble love. All of us can easily picture in our minds how this embarrassing scene unfolded. The disciples are where the Lord told them to be for the purpose that Jesus had said, to celebrate Passover, to institute the Lord's Supper. All disciples realize as they're going to have a meal together uh, that before you would recline, you would wash your feet for obvious reasons. Each of Jesus' disciples understood what needed to happen, but this task was so beneath them, or so they think. Someone else should step forward. I'm the oldest. It should be the youngest job. I followed Jesus before he did. Who knows what they were thinking, what thoughts in their minds they used to rationalize their inactivity. Nobody does anything, so nothing happens. Uh, There would have likely at some point been an awkward silence. And I want us, as we think back to the first century, and as we consider the inactivity of Jesus's his 11 believing disciples, I want us to bring that scene into the present and ask ourselves the question that I believe Jesus is is, is wanting us to consider whenever we, we study this monumental chapter. Everybody knows what needs to be done. Something needs to be done. Nothing is done. How many times does something like this unfold at church or in our own homes? And I want to go a little deeper, and I want us to ask the question, why? The reason why is because our love is often deficient. And because we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we should. Even a very solid, healthy church that was full of joy is given uh, the instructions that we read earlier in Philippians chapter 2. Have the mind of Christ. Each day, seek to live like Christ. Consider other people's interests as more important even than our own. God doesn't have to tell us to love ourselves, to take care of ourselves. We already do a a very good job of that unless we actually have a genuine mental health issue. So here we have a need, an opportunity. Every opportunity is a need, every need is an opportunity, and nothing happens. And this happens today all the time with us, disciples of Christ, notwithstanding. Dirty laundry. A mound of laundry means that somebody needs to do it in order to be clothed for church. Dirty dishes. A dirty bathroom. I'm sure your kids never fight over whose turn it is to clean the bathroom. I'm sure they, they, what they normally do is fight over uh, who has the, the, the privilege of cleaning the bathroom. For all of our new fathers and mothers, uh, whose turn is it to change the diaper? It could be cleaning up the dog doo-doo, emptying the litter box, humble love, sacrificial love, So many times when nothing happens, it's revealing something about ourselves. It's reminding us uh, how much we need a Savior. It's also pointing to the fact of, of, of what a perfect example we have in our Lord. It could be fulfilling one's marital duties, a la 1 Corinthians 7, 3. It might be stacking chairs at church, serving in the nursery, taking out the trash after a church fellowship meal, and the list of applicational possibilities goes on and on and on. Don't we have deacons for that? 
Isn't that the wife's job? Isn't that why we had eight kids? And Christian listener, God wants us to become more like Jesus. Romans 8, 29. But too often we act more like the knuckle-headed pre-Pentecost disciples. A pressing need is brought to our attention, but instead of prayerfully contemplating WWJD, we rationalize our selfishness, look the other way, or point to someone else. What I'm trying to get across is this. If we don't feel any personal conviction when reading this text, we are likely spiritually blind or our hearts have grown cold. We all need, myself included, a weekly dose of John 13. Back to verses 4 and 5. The master... Someone needs to do something. Nobody does. Jesus, the eternally majestic Son of God, the Word who became flesh, what in the world were these dudes thinking? And we don't have to guess because we have four Gospels. Luke's parallel account informs us that the 12 were often thinking about themselves. Too often thinking about themselves or thinking too much of themselves. In fact, later that very evening, they have a debate. And it's not over, you know, Is this guy the greatest or this guy the greatest? The question is, which of us is the greatest? Luke 22, 24. They had the same natural propensity to uh, think too highly of themselves as we do. And we have songs that actually celebrate this. You can tell everybody, yeah, you can tell everybody. Go and tell everybody, I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. Yes, I am, yes, I am, yes, I am. This is the way of the world. My friend, if our thoughts could talk, if our thoughts could talk, all would see how badly we need a Savior and the Holy Spirit. Surely one of the 11, especially when they saw Jesus move with action that foretold what he was preparing himself to do. Beloved, it is against the very dark backdrop of me-centeredness that the true light of the world shines brightest. Jesus waits until his proud disciples are all in their places, dirty feet notwithstanding. He waits, the drama builds, and then he acts. And he does another something that is unforgettable, or something that should be unforgettable, especially for those who who claim him as Lord and Savior. He models for them and us, the humility of love. The stage is set for the eternally majestic Son of God to put on a servant's apron as he washes the dirty feet of his disciples. Maybe they need their feet washed more than they realize, more than just the physical filth that would be present, caked on those who walked everywhere they went. 
And again, my friends, I've learned to read the Gospels uh, differently. I, I, I realize that too often I'm like these guys, though we're called to be like the guy, the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, verse 4, Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments. Taking a towel, he girded himself about. There's a sense in which this is often a forgotten piece of armor within the full armor of God, Ephesians 6. That's a different context talking about the spiritual warfare that we're involved in, not against known, seen enemies. It's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a greater battle going between darkness and light, evil and good, lies and the truth, Satan and God. But as we seek to each day fulfill that which God calls us to do in putting on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, let us not forget to include the towel. We are called by Christ, our captain, to be people of the towel. Verse 15, verse 14. This is exactly the point that Jesus makes. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, it would have been enough in that culture, it was uh, not the, the place of the teacher to stoop and wash the feet of his disciples. That enough is wrong. There's a pecking order of honor and distinction that is not entirely bad. And yet Jesus shows a, a, a different way, a better way. But more than that, this is the Lord of glory. Far greater than the fact that he's their master is the fact that he is their God. If the Lord and the teacher wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And in case we try to rationalize the lesson, Jesus doubles down clarifying that he's meaning and including you and I participating in this sort of thing, having this mindset, this heart posture. It's easy to say that you love somebody. It's easier to to say it than it is to show it. Jesus says, I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. What did he do? Verse 5, he poured water in the basins and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. It is a true wonder of wonders that Jesus loves us Believer, especially when we're at our worst. That is one of the most remarkable things about Christian marriage. And that's why we have vows that talk about the different contexts of life that we will find ourselves in. Sickness, health, for richer, for poorer when we're at our best and when we're at our worst. To love, to love like this, to love like Jesus, God help us. We have a a perfect example, the model of humble, sacrificial, Christ-like love. This is why we should have no problem praising God for Jesus, adoring Jesus, the beauty of his majesty, especially in his radical humility. Hallelujah, what a savior.
Hallelujah, what a friend. We have no deficiency of love if we're in Christ. Our love cup overfloweth. And that makes a profound difference in how we live our lives and in how we love others. Some people say, well, I, I, I struggle to be a loving person because I've experienced alienation and mistreatment and hatred. Yes, but we're, you're, you're forgetting about the love of God in Christ poured out on you. Jesus is your Savior. He is your friend. He is the perfect example. Church, I hope you're beginning to, to realize as we make our way through the, the different snippets of the life of Jesus Christ that every single portrait of the Son of God deserves our unreserved affection. There is no one like him. The music is great, but we don't come for the music per se. We come because of the one whom the praise team is leading us and singing about and to. You don't come to hear me preach, to talk. We come to, to see again the majesty and beauty of Christ. And here again, we, we see Jesus is altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful. Here we have the model of humble love. And so we... Realize that when we come to passages, if you want to turn to Philippians 2, Philippians written before John, the events of John obviously taking place before the writing of the Philippian letter to the Philippian believers. One of the reasons why this is such a happy place and a wonderful church is because of the, the love of Christ that we have, uh, that we we revel in every time we're together and his love for us, his perfect, pure, sacrificial, humble love changes uh, and transforms us from the inside out. This is such a loving church as it ought to be because we have such a loving Savior. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, Philippians 2, any consolation of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection of, and compassion... By the grace of God at this church, not perfectly, but truly, we could check, 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 check. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Have the same mind. Have the same mindset. Maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Friends, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest. Most of us do a very good job of that, but also for the interest of others. That's hard to do. Impossible without the Spirit. But in Christ, all things are possible, including this kind of mindset. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond slave. Don't forget who you are. Don't have an identity crisis. Uh, we come to church to remember who we are in Christ, who he is and who we are in him. Uh, be, a, be a church full of, it's a, it's a badge of honor to, uh, to be uh, numbered with one of Jesus' disciples. And Paul considered it a, a, a thing to glory in, in the fact that, that he and all, and all true believers are bond slaves of Jesus. He emptied himself, he took the form of a bond servant, made in the likeness of men, found in the appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself. He humbled himself in the 13th chapter of, of John in the upper room. When the disciples were uh, rationalizing their selfishness and pride, Jesus steps forward, goes down, and washes their feet. Hallelujah, what a Savior! 
Hallelujah. What a friend.